Welcome to Naples Nation to another uh, Fireside Chat. Our topic today is the beginning of a new era in American political, social, and economic history known as the Progressive Era. And that's a word that certainly is uh, kicked around an awful lot. And much like the Gilded Age and some of the themes that we talked about, like populism, for example, progressivism is a, is a term that I want to make sure we have a good grasp on as we move forward uh, throughout AP US history so that we have a, a good overarching understanding uh, of the term progressivism. Now, like with populism, the idea of progressivism shapes and morphs and shifts changes with the era that it's in. And coming off the Gilded Age, think of those themes about the Gilded Age that we mentioned. And the idea of progressive, regardless of what era that it's in, it tends to do with reform. That's really a word I'd like to think, uh, like to, for you guys to think about, uh, that this is an era of reform. And so if you consider what was going on in the Gilded Age, the political machines, the corruption, the tension with labor unions, the, the situation with the, the gold and silver standard, um, so on and so on, big business, uh, th there was a lot of corruption and people began to really start to consider it a, a civic duty to reform society. And the idea of reform should not be foreign to you in this class. If you think back to our antebellum period when you had the abolition movement, you had the temperance movement, you had movements to uh, bring about changes to mental health reforms. These movements uh, were really one of the first eras of American history with, with, with reform. But the progressive era is, is, is an unequivocal era of reform. And you gotta really think of it as, as, a, as a wide ranging umbrella. It's a wide ranging umbrella in that it covers a lot of different reform areas. For example, we're gonna talk about economic reform, towards big business. That's going to be a hallmark of the progressive era. We're going to look at uh, labor reform. So eventually the unions are going to start to have a breakthrough uh, and make a breakthrough as far as uh, labor, especially child labor. Gender reforms. Women are going to gain the right to vote uh, by the end of the progressive era. Political reforms, for example, the direct election of, of senators, uh, not through state legislatures. And so on and so on. There's going to be a, a multitude of reform going on in, in cities and states, excuse me, throughout the United States. So our mission is going to be for the next couple of days to chunk out certain areas of reform and look at how the government uh, from a federal level and also a state level, how the government was taking on this, this challenge of, of reform. And one thing to be aware of, so we're going to be getting into a lot of these different areas and uh, time frame. I know that a lot of you tend to think that uh, time frame throws you off a bit. So the progressive era sort of it begins in the late 1800s. I mean, I, I, it's not a definitive date necessarily. So it begins in the late 1800s and it's going to go on up until the 1920s. That's sort of the end of progressivism uh, in this, the progressive era. So knowing that, you're going to have to be able to handle the fact that there's a lot of presidents that sort of fit into this era. And it's kind of like the Gilded Age where I'm going to rattle off these presidents um, and, and McKinley, William McKinley, who we talked about his victory today, McKinley is considered to be one of the first progressive era presidents. Theodore Roosevelt will follow, and Roosevelt is going to be front and center with a lot of the issues that we get into, especially the ones that I'm going to start with today. And then you have uh, Big Daddy Taft, uh, William Ta Howard Taft, who was uh, president following Theodore Roosevelt. And then you get into Woodrow Wilson towards the end. So McKinley... Roosevelt, Taft, and um, Wilson are, are progressive presidents. And they're a little bit more well-known with all due respect to the Gilded Age presidents. So what I really want to get into first and foremost is a topic that uh, Part V is actually going to be in on this chat. And we're going to talk to you guys about um, environmentalism, or as, as sometimes it's referred to as conservationism. In America, with the growth of cities and the railroads, which we did actually mention that uh, railroad growth, um, the growth of the railroads uh, was was putting land uh, degradation uh, to the forefront. The environmental issues, Mother Nature versus Man's Progress, that's how we've been phrasing this. Here's a great time for you to look at this as a, uh, as a real issue because uh, people began to question whether the inner city, the living conditions, the, the sewage problems, the the excrement that was flowing out of factories into, into rivers, people began to seriously question uh, whether or not man's treatment of nature was to the, you know, to the benefit 
of the country. And so born out of this question about man's progress versus nature comes an environmental movement starting in the late 1800s. Um, there's a lot of different tangents that I could go down. But more importantly, I want to know, I want you to make sure you understand the genesis, the reason why. Why did this movement come about? Well, some people started to get really fed up with looking at how society was dumping sewage into rivers or destroying lakes or bulldozing and plowing over uh, land and, and making it unusable. So like many interest group movements and many grassroots movements, which you could say this is certainly grassroots, it takes, it takes a while to build momentum. Environmentalism got off to a slow start, but eventually it caught fire in the era of progressivism. So had this movement started maybe 30 years ago, during the Civil War, environmental, environmentalism may not have been as impactful as, as, it tend, as it happened to be. It goes back to what we always say. I mean, everything in here is timing. So the timing of the progressive era and the timing of the environmental movement was key. Uh, those two had to play well together. Now, um, there's no doubt that, that one of the foremost people that's going to take part in America's one of its first eras of environmentalism is Theodore Roosevelt. And we'll get into Teddy's rise into politics when we get into the political side here in class uh, this week. But Theodore Roosevelt's rise to power was astonishing. In fact, when he was elected uh, vice president, he was absolutely the youngest vice president ever elected. I mean, he was a superstar uh, in the making in the Republican Party. But before he got into politics, Roosevelt uh, was really a, a man about. He, he had wide casting nets, came from an extremely wealthy New York family, served as the governor of New York before getting into national politics. But before he became to Washington and, 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 and the White House, uh, Roosevelt uh, was a conservationist and he formed uh, a number of groups. And the group that I want you to know was called the Boone and Crockett Club. Boone and Crockett, as in Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett. It was named in honor of those famous frontiersmen from earlier American history. So Roosevelt and some of these big name, you know, big money people in, in, in um, society formed this con conservation club. And the club was really, it, it, its efforts were designed to spawn in greater interest and, and to bring about change and legislation towards protecting the environment. Uh, but it was slow going. Uh, up to this point, there was only one national, one or two national parks uh, that had, had been put aside, protected land. And uh, Yosemite was the first national park in, Amer in American history, founded in 1872. Um, so Roosevelt... He's going to use his, uh, his eventual, his influence in the White House. And Roosevelt, um, oh shoot, I'm sorry, it was Yellowstone. Please correct that. I meant Yellowstone. That's my bad. I, I thought I was wrong and then I didn't want to record it. So let's just Yellowstone. That was the first national park, 1872. Uh, Roosevelt's role as a prominent conservationist uh, really didn't take flight until he got into the presidency, which we'll talk about why that occurs tomorrow, but McKinley was assassinated. And Roosevelt put conservation into the national agenda. He really sold this as a priority. And he began to work with, with Congress to pass a number of acts. And I'm going to list these acts for you, so be ready to write these down. One of the acts was uh, the Newlands Rec... Rec Le the Newlands Rec... Le oh, my God. One of the acts was the Newlands Reclamation Act of 1902. And that was to promote and build dams and irrigate small farms, especially here in the Southwest. The Newlands Reclamation Act has direct impact here in Arizona. Uh, millions of acres of land across the Southwest was put aside and protected uh, but so the federal government could come in and build dams and, and irrigation. In fact, a lot of the canals systems here in Arizona uh, were built because of the, the Reclamation Act of 1902. So those areas were put under um, federal protection like the Salt River, for example. So that's federally protected land. You couldn't dump. And if you do, that's a felony. So Roosevelt and Congress team up to pass the Reclamation Act to build canals and to build dams throughout areas where, where water supply was tough. Roosevelt also signed into, into act the United States Forest Service, which is one of the, the National Park Services agencies um, that led to the creation of five national parks. Uh, during his, his presidency. So five national parks were built during, or, or not built, but set aside during Theodore Roosevelt's um, presidency. The other acts, we've got, we got the, the Reclamation Act and then also the Antiquities Act of 1906. Now the Antiquities Act of 1906 is super cool because it's due to that Antiquities Act that the Grand Canyon was actually labeled as a national monument. And 
because it was labeled as a national monument, it, it was set aside and was protected under this act. Now, the Grand Canyon didn't become a national park until 1919, but Roosevelt, who had visited the Grand Canyon and had been to the Grand Canyon, he had great awe and reverence for nature, and so he made it a priority during his president to take direct action. And it wasn't just Theodore Roosevelt. I mentioned the Boone and Crockett Club. You may have heard of the Autobahn um, um, or the Audu, Audubon. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce that. That's, I, I apologize if I'm offending any any members, but that's uh, it's it's a it's a, a conservation and wildlife society uh, that's out there and, and still in existence today. But I'm going to turn it over to Parthi here momentarily, and Parthi's going to go into um, one specific conservationist that Theodore Roosevelt had a very strong relationship with, and he would prove to be vital in the environmental movement of the Progressive Era. Hey, Push Nation. I know it's been a while. Hi, guys. Um, so my laptop's being super weird and not detecting any microphones or speakers, and so I'm going to use these headphones. Bear with me. I'm sorry. Not very professional. But hi. Uh, Mr. Smith probably just introduced the whole progressive movement and the idea of environmentalism and how it plays into that. And so just in a sentence, environmentalism, environmentalism and the whole conservation movement came about because of the breathtaking landscapes and portraits that were being produced in the time period and people realized the need to preserve certain places um, away from society and just take a moment and enjoy nature. So John Muir is someone you need to think of when you hear the word environmentalism. He is a staunch advocate for preserving the nature and preserving the environment. He the big reason as to why Muir even found it worthy of his time is because he believed that God revealed himself through nature. And so anything that the whole landscapes and things like that had to say, it was how God said that how like us people needed to work on themselves and nature and society and things like that. So he believed that nature had this very, very um, ideal and divine um, outlook. So a couple of things you need to know about John Muir. I have a feeling you might have a primary source on him in the A-Push Multiple Choice, and so he is important. Uh, he was the president of the Sierra Club. It's just a club that had to do with like mountain preservation and things like that, so just remember Sierra Club and John Muir being the president of that, or the founder. Um, one of his greatest lasting legacies was that he... Um, made sure that a dam, like a water reservoir, wasn't built in San Francisco. He felt like the city didn't need that there, and it was hurting the nature and beauty of the city. The other biggest thing you need to know about him is that him and Roosevelt were very, very close. He did this three-day trip with Roosevelt um, throughout the whole Yosemite Valley and the grove of the Mariposa Grove, and this three-day camping trip with the president is the reason that Yosemite probably exists today because of how much John Muir convinced Roosevelt to preserve the nature and preserve the beauty of such certain landscapes. Um, other than that, he's done a lot of things, little, little things here and there, but the biggest thing you need to know about him is that he cared about the environment really, really much so. Big part of the environmental movement. Um, he loved he was the founder of the sierra club he loved nature i think i said that already multiple times just so you didn't get the if you got if you didn't get the point um he worked very closely with roosevelt and congress to make sure that nature was preserved and was reserved for people to enjoy and for god to sort of shed his light on people and it was because of his relationship with roosevelt on the three-day camping trip that he did that yosemite national park and certain national parks exist um Back to you, Mr. Smith. Okay, so thank you, Parthi, um, for your breakdown on John Muir. And you were right. The students will definitely see more Muir later. So just to recap, Theodore Roosevelt, without him in the White House, the environmental movement may not have grown to such lengths. The Acts, the Reclamation Act, the Antiquities Act, you need to know those. Those are key for short answers or essays, potentially. Um, setting aside so much land that, you know, Roosevelt put, I looked the stat up uh, here uh, earlier, Roosevelt put aside more land during his presidency than any president had prior to his, his presidency. That, that just tells you everything you, you need to know about what was going on uh, in this era of progressivism. And the environmental conservation movement, no doubt, is a hallmark of progressivism. Our job the next couple of days is to, re is to look at how 
other aspects, what other aspects of progressivism are out there and, and what are they, uh, what do they look like and what are they, um, how are they manifesting into bringing about more reform into society, into society. So that's it for today. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed. If you have questions, bring them at the beginning of class tomorrow. Uh, hope you guys have a great rest of your evening. Uh, take care. The past shapes the future. Come to the basketball game tomorrow. It's senior night. Uh, we're going to make that a big deal. And, of course, you know, the secret weapon for the seniors. I don't know. Hopefully got that. I'll get that three-point curry shot going. Um, so take care, everybody, and have a good evening. The past shapes the future.